Hello. Welcome to One Plus One. My name's Gail Marbo. I'm here in Palm Island. This is my mother's country. This is the land of the Mumbra people. And for me, this is home. Dan, we we'll welcome you in the country. That's my granddaughter, she's a Mumbra. She's not a worker. When we do smoking ceremony, we perform just to prevent the evil spirit from causing any problems. So the smoking ceremony is also a healing process. And this feels like, you know, it's magic. This is a magic space. Because, you know, it is, it is about the first peoples of this place. And that's my connection, is to those people. And so for me, it's like, I've just been welcomed back to home. Gail Marvo, thanks for inviting me to your mother's country of Palm Island for One Plus One. Thank you, you're welcome. Your name, Mabo, is synonymous with the Torres Strait and with Indigenous politics in Australia. I, I want to talk to you about that side of your story in a moment. But first, this is incredible country. Tell me about Palm Island and what it means to you. Well, Palm Island to me, it is part of my history because, yep, it's my mother's country. I always grew up in a Torres Strait house. So knowing that as my, my background, but then as I got older, Mum said, well, it's time to learn about your Aboriginal and South Sea Island side. And I went like, what? We got more family to work out? <laughs> she wanted us to grow up in a Torres Strait house because that was the strongest cultural um, connection we had was through Dad. But then when Dad passed away, Mum then said, you need to actually understand now the other side of your family. I'm an Aboriginal, um, traditional owner of Palm Island. That's on the Aboriginal side, my grandmother. Gail, tell me, why is this place so important to you? Well, I didn't know my connection to Palm Island until I was older. The first time I ever came here, I was only eight. We came across on Dad's boat, and in this area, just here where we are, there was an old oyster shack, and that's where we stayed. There was wooden floors, but the wood had gaps between. And so I remember mum giving us all um, blankets and we just put the blankets and we just slept on the floor with a blanket and a pillow. And I remember lying there and hearing the water just hit against the palings that were in the water and just that sound sort of lulled us off to sleep. But then when we woke in the morning, there wasn't the sound, but when we opened the doors up, the water was right at the level of the, of the deck. Yeah, wow. And so it was just like, wow, it was that brilliant moment. My forebears came from here, and so therefore I acknowledge them to say, this space is now my space. It's a journey of discovery for me, because I'm finding out all these pockets of information and these wonderful stories through just conversations. What do the old people tell you? What are the stories they share with you when you sit with them here on country? So um, the first one was with Grandad Walter. And so with Grandad Walter, right, he actually told me the story of Tambo Tambo. Tambo Tambo was taken from Palm Island to be part of a, of a group of people who went to America to become performers in a circus because Indigenous peoples were um, acrobats, natural acrobats. When my grandfather went looking for the remains of our old people, they came across Tambo Tambo and they brought him back and laid him to rest on country. Because people's souls don't rest until they're in the right place. For me, one of the, one of the significant stories that came out of here was that my grandfather told me of the, the first sighting of Captain Cook's vessel just off Palm Island. And when they did, they were sitting at the top of the island and they carved it into a rock. And so 
When he was telling me about that story, it was like he was telling me a story that came from the stars. They called them the ghost people. The ghost people who were on these things with big white sails and then they were, they were people all dressed in white. And so that what evokes me to, to do more art is that because they're so different, the stories that are told from both my Aboriginal and my Torres Strait side, plus also it'll be interesting when I find more people on my South Sea Island side and that connection to where we come from in Vanuatu to have more stories that, that I can put in my little kit bag and carry with me. And where we're sitting right now is a half an hour flight from Townsville where you live. Tell me, what was growing up there like? We had lots of Torres Strait families in Townsville, so we got to know a whole lot of them. Plus also, too, we had some Aboriginal families that would visit us and then we just thought that, you know, there's another uncle, another thing, who knew mum? But we didn't really know the connections until we got older. Eventually, mum sort of laid out the script and said, this is how we're all connected. And then for me, it was like, ah, oh, the piece of the jigsaw puzzle just fell into place. What's that feel like when the piece of the jigsaw puzzle falls into place, when you can see more of the picture? It feels like there's that sense of, I know who I am. That's the last piece of the jigsaw puzzle that needs to be there. Growing up, how much did you hear about your father's homelands of Moor Island? Oh, from, I think, from when we were small, Dad would sing for us and he'd teach us dances. Learning the language comes through learning of songs and when you sing songs, it's learning and making sure that you can pronounce language properly. So he taught us as much as he could because culturally too, he had more girl children than boys and so we were to be taught by our aunties who were extensions of our family who were our other mothers. And, um, I think you've all heard that we've, that we've taken the matter to court on the uh, basis of the international common law of uh, occupation and enjoyment. And while you and your siblings had that education and learning, the rest of the country was really getting to know your dad as this titan of change and challenging the incorrect doctrine of terra nullius. Tell me about that time. What was that like for you? Well, when dad was going through his court case, I would have been about uh, 15, high school, so I remember coming home from school, walking past the bedroom door, going like, look, and then looked again, and went like, hey, what are you doing? He goes, I'll just draw you, and he's sitting there with paper and pen, and he's drawing himself, and, and, he's, and he's looking, and he's doing the shape of his head, and then comes down to his eyes, and I said, your eyes are the wrong colour. He goes, it's what we want it to be. And I went like, oh, OK. I said, so you want golden eyes, you don't want brown eyes. He goes, yeah, it looks better. Don't you think it looks better? And I went like, nah, you're brown eyes. Make it brown. And then, then he put a red bandana across his head. I remember saying to him, that's very radical. Then he goes, yeah, but my girl, you remember, one day all of Australia will know my name. He was that confident. He was that confident. That he was, that he was doing the yeah. right thing and that there would be change. Yep, and people would know his name. I wonder what sort of impact that case had on, on you and your family as it, as it did go on. Well, he'd come home from, from Canberra and what we'd do, he'd load us all up in the back of the car, take us down to the beach and then he'd go drag a net with the boys in the water to catch as much fish as he could to stock up our freezer. So we had fish for days because he needed the money that we were getting in our house to help him get to Canberra because there was no one else financially helping him get there. And we, it'd be enough for him to get a bus ticket to get down there. But the funny thing is, when he got there, he really had no money. During the day, he'd go to court and he'd just drink water because he had no money to buy food. So it was his vision, but it was really the whole family who made it possible for, for him to seek it or search for it. Yeah, because as we got older, you know, we were 
off doing our own things. But then we knew he was fighting and we knew that they were doing it hard. And so we would help. We would help the best way we could. Sometimes Dad would come back from Canberra and he'd stop into me when I was living in Kempsey, New South Wales, just to break his trip and connect with me and my children. And I remember one of the trips he came back and we were sitting on the back step and he goes, you know, my girl, they're trying to discredit me. And I said, oh, about what? He goes, just trying to dig up as much dirt as they can on me. And I said, well, how much dirt you got to dig in your backyard? He goes, not much. He goes, I got a parking ticket. And I said, well, be proud about that then. That if that's the only thing that they can find on you, mm -hmm. so be it. And then as I said that, he hung his head and he was sort of drinking his tea, but you could see his body was changing. He, was, he started doing the shoulders up and, and I could see he was crying. So I put my hand on his, on his back and I mm, looked at my sons and I sort of got them to come quickly, come quick, quick, quick. Your Atta, so meaning grandfather, needs a hug. Quick, come and give him a big hug. And they sat on his lap and just held him. And he just cried with the two boys in his arms. And for me, it was like, that's how comfortable my dad was with me, that he could actually cry and be not ashamed to cry in front of me and to show that raw emotion. And for me, that's my golden moment, that my dad could share things like that with me. Must have been tough to see that, your dad feeling that way. Yes, yep. And you know, one of the things that I found very painful was that the last time that my dad was to have Christmas, I couldn't go anywhere near with him because he was radioactive. And I was pregnant with my third son. And that killed me. Because I couldn't go and give my dad a hug. What a, what a cruel position to be in. Yeah, my heart was broken for my dad. Gail, you, your dad died before the case was settled. How did you, where were you when you found out that he'd won? I was sitting at the Kempsey Hospital with my son, William, who was going on six months old. We'd, be, we'd gone with my mother-in-law. She needed to go up and see somebody there and I went like, Okay, well, we'll just come for a drive and just sit in the car and wait for you. So I was sitting there and he had a squawk, so I got him off and gave, was giving him a feed. And then on the radio. After 200 years, white Australian law has finally time, acknowledged that... Australia has recognised the legal existence of Aborigines... ..for recognition of their traditional rights to the island. And then they say, Eddie Mabo has won. I look at my son and I start to cry. Because you said you were going to do this. You succeeded. And then as I was crying and I looked to the skies and I could see the clouds rolling in. And I went, yep, yeah, he's moving the furniture. He's going to dance. He's happy. He's happy he's won. Gail, I first met you about eight or so years ago at the burial site of, of your dad on his homeland. It was such a, a special visit for me as a much younger reporter then. You were there in an official capacity as the Marbo family spokesperson. Tell me, how did that come about? How did you become the person speaking on behalf of all of your family? Well, funny you say that. It was, it was through a conversation that I had with my mother and my brothers were there. And I said to mum, OK, Mum, out of the two brothers, who do you think is going to step up and take this on? Because we need to have someone who's going to be the face of the family. So who is that out of these two boys? Just tell me which one. And the boys just went like, no, we're not going to do that. And then I said, why not? And they said, Those, Dad's shoes are too big, we can't fit them. So I ended up going home, sitting on my bed and going, Dad, I know you're out there, I know you hear me, I want you to come and sit next to me. Come and plant yourself here. And I was patting my bed. And then 
in a couple of minutes, when I look, I see a divot on my bed and I said, okay, I know you're near, now show yourself. So he would then appear sitting next to me. And I said, I said, can you answer this question for me? Out of your two sons, who is the one that I need to actually help to become the one who takes on your shoes now and that takes on the responsibility of the family? And he smiled at me and he looked down. And I said, yeah, those things. And then he smiled again and he looked towards me and I went, what are you looking at? So I looked and the shoes were in front of my feet and I put my foot forward. And I said, see, they're too big for me. And I moved my foot back. And he smiled and he looked down. This time they were under my feet. I said, see, it's still way too big. So which one? And then... Lo and behold, he looks down again and my feet are in his shoes. They're done up and they're completely wrapped around my feet. And I went, oh, Dad, I just had triplets and you want me to do what? Happy Marbo Day, everybody. What's that meant for you, being the one that holds that family story? It's... um. It's, it takes me to places where I have to do a lot of things myself. Because, like all families, you know, we, we struggle with lots of things. And even do my, the, I love my dad and I love my mother. But when it came to the legacy, it was a very lonely road to walk. Because no one would understand what I was doing and why I was doing it to maintain it un being untainted, being seen by people as a positive. That was very hard. One of the things I found was that I distanced myself from my family because of the negativity that came from them, the hate they felt towards me because they thought I was grandstanding just for myself. And I said, I'm not. I said I was given a responsibility and I stepped up to the plate to take on this responsibility for all of us. I'm not doing it for myself. I'm doing it to honour our father. And so for me, that was the hardest thing, was having that backlash from my own family. So sometimes with that responsibility, it took on moments of just being very draining, very disappointing. And sometimes, you know, I would, I would stand and cry because it was like, I'm doing this because my dad asked me to. But it's so hard, it's such a long and lonely road. I would even have Indigenous peoples say that, you know, you know, what your father's done now means nothing. Now we have to try this whole new thing. And I said, well, at least he's opened the door. But it also did change the country. Today, the High Court in Canberra ruled the Merriam people are entitled to possession, occupation, use and enjoyment of the island, effectively recognising their native title. It threw out that inaccurate notion of terra nullius, that it was empty here. It, it showed that in, inalienable connection that was exactly what was found there. And it changed the way legal structures worked around Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander land and the connection. In, in spite of what some of those have said to you, what do you think your dad's legacy is? My dad's legacy to me is, is that whole sense of knowing that Indigenous peoples have a right a right to country, a right to speak their language and a right to do their dances in a space that they know is theirs and they have a connection to. And so for me, just going to, even if I come to somewhere and they do a welcome to country for me, just the notion of going like, Dad's given you that right back. Because we had it a long time ago. 
It was taken away from us. But now we stand stronger as a people to say, this is who we are and this is where we come from. And we welcome you to our country. We're sitting right now on your mum's country and, and your mum, Benita, was a powerhouse in her own right, an activist, an advocate, a, someone who was speaking out and pushing forward a, a, an agenda around rights. What do you see as your mum's legacy? Well, mum was always one to make sure that young women could and would have the right to speak and be heard. Because sometimes we get bullied by those older people to be quiet. And it's time for, you know, us to step aside and let those young people come through. Let us hear their voice. And she wanted to have South Sea Island people recognised as peoples in the Australian Constitution because they were never ever recognised, South Sea Island people, to live in Australia. They were deemed to be like stock that were bought from another place to work the land. And when they died, their bodies were entrenched in the ground. They became the fertiliser for the, the cane fields. So for me, that's a powerful past that she comes from that needs to be recognised, understood and also talked about. I'm going to teach you how to make a fish. Because um, when I learned, my mum taught me. So it's just a matter of you just following me. And then, oh, you're doing really well. That's good. And bring this across. Oh, you're faster than me. Hey, so, jumping ahead. <laughs> when you look at it, at the end, we're your family, we're whole. We started off as two pieces, two separate that, pieces. that weren't connected. Mm -hmm. Is that, in a sense, is that what you see as family, is the weaving in and bringing together different people and stories to get a, a, whole, a, a whole picture? Everything is interwoven because the stories of one place interconnect with the story of somewhere else, but it makes that bigger picture. As well as truth-telling, we're having a big national conversation about recognition, and about the Constitution and a voice to Parliament. I wonder, have you landed on a position on the referendum and the voice to Parliament? I have, but, you know, for me, I want it to be my own choice. I don't want to be one to sway anyone. I don't want to be the one to tell them, you have to, you have to. Because that's, you tell someone, if it's, it's like a child, you tell someone you have to, they guess what they're going to do? They're going to do the opposite. <laughs> so therefore, you know, you just give the people the information, you allow them to make up their own mind, because at the end of the day, it's a, it's a personal journey. You've always been incredibly creative. You've been a choreographer, a dancer, an actress, an, an <laughs> artist as well. Tell me, where does that creative streak come from and what does it mean for you to, to create things? Um, I think for me, being the creative, I think comes from both sides because Dad was a watercolourist and Mum was a creative that could put a hand on something and make something. So it came from both my parents. For me, it's the creative arts through play and looking at something and not looking at it in a serious manner going, OK, if I was to pull this apart and be a little kid and have fun with it, what magic shall happen? I wonder how much your art, Cal, is about telling stories and about using those stories to connect, because I understand there's a whole series that you're working on across platforms about stars in the sand. Mm -hmm. So the one that you're talking about, I, I, I did one, it's called Tug Eye. Now, to us in the Torres Straits, Tuga is a story about the warrior who crosses the sky in his canoe. Because Tuga dictates to us when it's time to plant, when it's time to harvest, and when it's time to go hunting. And so I looked at it and I, I thought, OK, he's the man in the stars. What do I do the stars out of? And I remember 
when I was eight and Dad took us back the first time to Murray Island. And he sat us down and he put out, he said, put your hand out. I'm like, OK. And he dropped some sand into it. We're looking, going like, mm, OK. Then he goes, wipe the sand. So we wiped the sand and we were like, mm-hmm, it's sand. And he goes, find the stars. And we went like, what? He goes, in your hand, find the stars. And so we're looking at this sand on our hand and then we started going, oh, I can see a star. And then we kind of started counting these stars and there were so, so many that we couldn't keep up. And I took some sand with me to the microscopic labs in Sydney at the Sydney University. And I said, can you get a 3D read off a grain of sand? And they said, yeah, we can. I went, how cool is that? <laughs> and then they gave me a 3D printout of what it would look like. Because the grain of sand under the microscope actually looks like a star, doesn't it? It does, a perfect star. And so for my tug-eye map, I then used the stars to be the stars on my map. So it was a story about connecting. The story came from Torres Straits. It's a connection of, of place. The sand came from Murray Island and it was a connection with me and my dad when he first gave me that sand to come full circle. One of the, the big parts of Indigenous culture is, is around sharing stories, what you do through your art, what you're doing with me right now. You've got seven children, 11 <laughs> grandchildren. What do you see as your role in that family dynamic, in that family unit now? Well, for me, it's that thing of like, I'm still mum to my children. You know, I'll be forever mum. And because I took on the legacy as part of my family, I now have to instill that, you know, that I have to, that legacy is handed to my children. So I have to look for that person to give it to. That role will be for my son. And with that, he's taken himself to uni to do archaeology and anthropology. And so for me, looking back before he goes forwards is the best way of looking and understanding of where you come from because you've got to acknowledge both. Gail, what does it mean to be an elder? Am I an elder? No, because I have people who are senior to me, but I have lots of people who look up to me. And so therefore, yeah, I take on that responsibility and become the auntie, become the nana in the room. But to me, it's just being there and ha wanting to have that conversation about whatever it is that they want to. Gail, there are moments in time that shape who we are as a people, what our country is, and, and perhaps give us a glimpse of what we can be. What's your vision for the future of Australia? Wow, that's a big question. And you want me to answer that one? Oh, my goodness. OK, let me try. Let me break it down now. OK, okay. go on. It's hammer time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, wow. For me, the notion of people moving forward with an understanding of Indigenous Australia would be the most powerful thing we can do. So, with the stepping into the changing of the referendum would be a mark of understanding that people are accepting for the change. So let's be the change for a better Australia as a united, united front, not a divided front. Gail Marbo, thank you for joining me on One Plus One. Thank you for having me.